Creativity is a topic that to many people is very abstract. That is, we know when something seems creative, some of us know people who are creative or perhaps are creative, and yet the ability to be creative resides in everybody. And we know that because the neural circuits that underlie creativity have been somewhat defined and the steps and processes within the brain and body that lead to creativity are well known. That said, most people don't know how to access creativity, and if they do know how to access creativity, they are only able to access creativity in a fairly limited number of domains of life. But as it turns out, all of creativity stems from just a small subset of neural structures in the brain that need to be activated in a particular sequence or order. What particular order they need to be activated in in order to come up with, for instance, new ideas that are creative, and then how to implement those creative strategies. One particular tool that I'm excited to share with you involves a I want to discuss creativity in terms of what actually goes into being creative. And it turns out there are just two elements. And those two elements are now well understood from the perspective of psychology. And fortunately, the neuroscience well supports what the psychology says and vice versa. And those two elements that go into coming up with a creative idea and then implementing or developing that creative idea into something real that you and the rest of the world can experience are divergent thinking and convergent thinking. And divergent thinking and convergent thinking are very straightforward to understand. Divergent thinking is taking some known object or event in the world or sport or concept, it could be running, it could be a musical note, it could be jumping, it could be a particular color on a piece of paper, and asking yourself, how many different things could that thing actually be? You might say, well, running is running, but let's use divergent thinking as a way to illustrate what divergent thinking is. If I show you a picture of somebody running, I say, what do you see? And you say, I see somebody running. And then I might give you a divergent thinking task, and these tasks are the same ones used in various experiments. And I'd say, how many different things can you think about based on this picture that you see of somebody running? Now, if you are able to engage divergent thinking, you could say running to the store, running away from a lion, running towards somebody I love, or maybe you have a more elaborate imagination and you could say running in front of a bus to grab a kid so the kid doesn't get hit by the bus or running toward a concert because I'm so excited about the particular concert and then it starts to spool into a story. In other words, divergent thinking involves taking one simple what we would call in neuroscience or psychology, stimulus, one image or sound, et cetera, and trying to radiate out from that as many different divergent situations, properties, characteristics, events, things from that one specific element. So any divergent thinking task would involve exactly that. Divergent thinking is really the process that underlies idea generation. And the basis of divergent thinking is that more than one idea is correct. In fact, the more ideas that you have about one thing, the better your divergent thinking. Then in the context of divergent thinking, any answer goes, but as we'll soon learn, not every answer is interesting and relevant. That is not every answer helps solve something or reveal something fundamental, and therefore not every divergent answer is truly creative. So if I hold up this pen and you say orangutan, that's a perfectly valid divergent idea from this pen because you thought of it and it's distantly related. However, we have to remember our earlier rule. If black pen and orangutan are not linked up in our brain, in the observer's brain, in any kind of meaningful way, it's only interesting to you because you are the only one that understands the rule that underlies the link between this pen and orangutan. Whereas if you come up with something different that somehow tells me and everybody else something interesting about pens or orangutans, now that's a truly creative idea. Divergent thinking involves a sort of exploration. It's a wandering through of ideas that you already had in your library, in your memory banks about pens and what pens could be related to and what pens ought not to be related to. So again, what's really important about creativity is that there has to be the basic building blocks already existing within us. This is why it's so important to understand that if you are somebody who really seeks to be creative, you really do need to be somebody who forages for information and structured information in particular 
if you are to be creative. The architect simply can't come up with incredible drawings or plans for buildings without understanding how buildings are put together and the various rules that govern buildings. In other words, you can't break rules that you don't understand. The second part of creativity where things are tested and where truly creative elements are discovered is in convergent thinking. And convergent thinking is, as the name suggests, just the opposite of divergent thinking. Convergent thinking would be, for example, if I give you an image or I tell you the following things. I say, wing, water, an engine. The concept that I happen to have in mind is that of a plane that can land on water, right? Most planes don't land on water or not intended to land on water. One would hope that their plane doesn't land on water unless it's a plane designed to land on water. But in this case, a plane that can land on water is one of the very few answers that can combine wing, water, and engine, right? I'm sure there are other answers. There are other convergent thinking modes that can take you to an answer that would be valid, but there are not many. And here, what's really most important is that I'm not asking you to spool out or to radiate out from these three things. Rather, I'm asking you to combine them in some way that makes sense in the real world. Okay, so that's just one example of convergent thinking. And a convergent thinking task would involve you being given a list of two or three or maybe even five different things. And then for each of those two or three or five different things, as quickly as you can to come up with a single answer that binds all of those in a real world concept that obey the laws of nature or physics in some way. For instance, you could just come up with some uh, you know, answer that said, uh, a bird that um, swallowed an engine and that happens to be a seabird. Y you could come up with that, but that actually is not something that happens or is that very typical at all. And so it seems like kind of a, a mishmash of things that are really just designed for you to try and accomplish an answer rather than something real, such as a plane that lands on water. Okay, the point here is that divergent thinking is one aspect of our cognition, of our thinking, and convergent thinking is a very distinct aspect of our cognition. In fact, one of the critical requirements for convergent thinking is also to access our memory banks and our understanding about the outside world, just as it were with divergent thinking, but it requires more focus and more persistence. In fact, if we were to come up with a key rule for divergent thinking, it would be you almost want to have just enough focus to remember what the initial object or thing that was mentioned was to keep that in mind so that your answers don't become completely random. But the more distant and everywhere in between that you can generate answers, that is the things that are very close to pens, you know, black pen, red pen versus, you know, pen and doorstop, pen acting as a doorstop. Those are, one is very close. Red pen is very close to black pen. Doorstop is pretty far from black pen. So that's the idea is that you want to explore and undergo a range of exploration of different ideas. Whereas with convergent thinking, you're really trying to bind these things together. And so the key element for convergent thinking is the aspect of persistence and focus. And that's why convergent thinking in many ways feels harder than divergent thinking. It feels like there's an answer and I want to get the answer right and I can't solve it. It's a puzzle and it's a puzzle that relies on very distinct brain circuits from divergent thinking.